Retroval Gamecast is brought to you by TempleofGeek.com, your one-stop shop for all things geek. You can find all our episodes and fulfill your sci-fi, fantasy, and geek culture-related needs at TempleofGeek.com. Welcome to the Retro Rebel Gamecast, where we discuss gaming and related topics. Retro Rebel is released Fridays, and you can find this episode and much more by heading to templeofgeek.com or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. You can even find us on Facebook and Instagram at Retro Rebel Podcast for exclusive content and to see what else we're up to. My name is Amanda, and this week I'm joined again by our special guest co-host, Holly. How are you doing, Holly? Hey. Hey. (laughs) Thanks for coming back. I didn't scare you away the first time, so that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that makes me happy. Um, so today we are discussing accessibility in games, which is why I brought yourself on. But before we do that, we have a little ritual where we just talk about what we've been playing. So um, what have you been playing in the last couple of days? Uh, I've been enjoying playing Can't Stop on Board Game Arena. It's a dice rolling push your luck game where your character is supposed to try and scramble up mountain paths of various difficulties and you get the top you plant your flag three flags and you're the winner Uh, it's um fun and a bit infuriating because you just have to know when to stop pushing your luck but (laughs) it's really enjoyable i never know and in fact i didn't realize there was actually a way to play that game i have been playing recently i didn't realize that once you um open up three paths on any one turn if the dice doesn't roll your way and it and your only option is to open a four path that's when you're done so that's where the push your luck happens see i was just sort of blindly rolling like just to see how i felt um (laughs) and making silly choices like opening up two paths right away on the first roll instead of if there's an option to just stay on one path for a while taking that. So um, I there is a way, there's a strategy to play it, but at the end of the day, it is kind of luck of what you get and when, when you stop in time or not. But I agree, that is a very fun game. I'm definitely going to be playing it tomorrow for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've been playing Horrified in person. Uh, I played it on the weekend with some of the people from uh, Get Gaming Online and it's a cooperative horror game where the players are trying to save townspeople and themselves from like your classic horror monsters so like dracula frankenstein and his bride the swamp thing the invisible man like it was really good and we were able to play the game twice through with three different monster setups each time obviously the more monsters you have the harder it is the first time the monsters kicked our butt like 100 percent we did not win. But the second time, um, through maybe some creative use of the rules, we went we won in like the very last possible turn. It was it was, you know, let's be honest, it, we were giving ourselves a slight advantage, but we really <laughs> wanted to win because we'd been playing this thing for like an hour. Um, it's really challenging. The monsters obviously will either eat you or the townspeople, but the townspeople can't protect themselves. So you want it you want the monsters to be closer to you so they try to attack the players instead and you get like special cards if you can rescue the townspeople and get them where they want to go it's very cool it's a very interesting game it's pretty detailed and the little figurines for the monsters are pretty cute my only criticism perhaps is that the figurines for everyone else are just little paper paper cards like in in those little stands and Mm -hmm. i just think like for the cost of games these days, like, I mean, I just ordered a board game from Legendary Encounters and that game is like 65 quid brand new. And I luckily got it for 35 quid still sealed on eBay because someone had like dropped it on its corner. So like the corner of the box is dented. I don't give a shit about that. But I think mm-hmm. buying used board games is a real difficulty because if even one piece is missing, you can mess up the whole game. So I think if you're going to be, if you're almost always going to be buying new, then the pieces should be molded, surely. Like it's just plastic. Are you telling me that it's that expensive to die cast a bunch of plastic little things? I don't think so. Monopoly's been doing that since like the 40s. So, (laughs) Um, but that's just my little diatribe about (laughs) board games. (laughs) So no, that that's really cool. I love Can't Stop, so I can see why you've been playing it. Um, 
I've been still obsessed with Marrakesh, although I'm finding it harder to like get a table together because it, it seems like people think there isn't going to be a table. And even though if you're premium, you can make your own, if people aren't looking for it, then you just sit there for a while. So yeah. I'll have to be playing that tomorrow after work in our little impromptu. All right. Well, that brings us to the main topic, which is accessibility in games. Now, um, I have brought Holly back onto the show because you have a very specific perspective on this that is much more enriched and valid than mine as just someone who does some research on the internet. So could you share a little bit about what it's been being um, a, a child growing up and gaming in a disabled environment and the, the challenges sort of for yourself to frame why you're here today and then we'll discuss the topic as a whole. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I had a really rare form of cancer called neuroblastoma that metastasized everywhere and got me from 18 months till about 10 years old. So I grew up a lot of my time in hospital. And luckily on kids wards in hospital back then and today, uh, from what I could gather, they had carts with like a SNES on it or a Sega Mega Drive on it and they'd like roll it up next to your bed and you'd sit there and play and just for me it was a wonderful escape into a world that wasn't just so full of like hardship and struggle and pain and suffering that I, I could be Sonic zooming through you know the Green Hill Zone if I wanted. Uh, I could really found a wonderful escape and I think because of that I've grown up with games and with gaming and I've had to as I've aged and the repercussions of cancer and cancer treatment kind of exacerbates I, I've had to try and find more and more different ways to find accessible games and to be able to play in a manner that actually suits me rather than just going and play, oh, I'll play for 15 minutes and then feeling like my arms don't work anymore. Because <laughs> I have issues with motor control mm -hmm. and um, sometimes I don't know how hard I'm hitting a button down. Uh, I struggle with using like triggers on controllers, for example. So anything where with like remapping of controls, things like that. There is so much that I've found that has become really helpful in the past I don't know like five years or something it's like the gaming industry has woken up to this huge huge amount of like disabled gamers out there like we will play these games we will love these games we will tell each other what works how it works and like Last of Us 2 blew up within disabled disabled Twitter because it had so much built in that was so supportive and due to that everybody heard about it and people that would never have considered to play Last of Us 2 and didn't play Last of Us played it and loved it it opens doors it, it's wonderful uh, I think that there's so much joy that can be given through video gaming and just trying to take those little barriers away is it can make a huge impact i think that's pretty powerful and i think um just hearing your story has really helped me think about accessibility in gaming because you know to the eye you look just as capable as everyone else i wouldn't know unless you told me that you know you struggle with mobility issues and your motor control and um you have a story about quick time events that we'll get to later that just baffled my mind but i think um you know that is probably the challenge that you know not all disabilities are visible and um the market for accessible gaming is larger than i think anyone wants to admit if you include things like mental health issues or mild vision impairments or things that people wouldn't necessarily um, trigger in their minds when they think of the word disability, but which are an impairment to gaming regardless. So um, 
I'm, I'm glad that you could be here today. We're going to hit some of the high notes on some of the common things that we're starting to see in games and then some of the things that you have highlighted and recommended for the gaming industry to look at, follow, take note of in order to, to make improvements. You know, things like The Last of Us where you see something blowing up for its features. I think that's something the gaming industry should really tap into. So uh, I want to thank you for being here today and we're going to get into it. And I also want to thank Laura K. Buzz on YouTube um, and Make It Missoula. These were resources that I really tapped into in order to do my own research on this topic. Um, and Laura K. Buzz is a pretty prominent um, accessibility gaming advocate, as you yourself are. So um, with you guys' help, I'm pretty sure that I will be able to talk about this issue in a manner that doesn't embarrass um me and the show so um to hit it off we're going to talk about some of the things that were covered by the cvaa legislation waivers that ended in 2018. so this is basically the sort of standard of practice that game companies are required to adhere to um and why they're becoming more common is that at least in the states these are now requirements and i've linked to it and you can read the legislation it's i mean let's be honest i doubt much would happen if they weren't followed other than maybe a small fine i think that's the way it goes with most of this sort of stuff um but they are representing a standard that the whole industry is trying to move to so the first one is um helping people who are um don't have the use of their hearing. So providing subtitles for all nonverbal information, including denoting who is speaking and also providing the lyrics of music when it's significant. And I think that last one is pretty rare. You only really see that on television shows, I feel like, and like movies when you watch closed captioning. Um, up until recently, and I'm pretty sure, let's be honest, still now, there isn't really a standard for closed captioning like there is with other forms of media. So I think that uh, while I've never really thought about it, I use subtitles all the time, but that's only because I'm trying to skip ahead and I just want to quickly read what I need to do and make a decision. I'm not actually relying on it for the story. And I think if you were relying on it, if the music matters or knowing who's speaking matters, especially with so few animated mouth movements in the majority of games, that's probably pretty helpful. <laughs> um, and I think that goes hand in hand with the accommodations for people who have limited sight or sight challenges. So um, colorblind spectrum coding, fonts for dyslexia friendly, um, and games for the blind and visually impaired. Now, Holly, you had mentioned someone that you're familiar with on Twitter called Super Blind Man, who does yeah, accessibility Yeah, Super testing. Blind Man. Yeah, um, Brandon Cole, he's an awesome gamer, and he's always been very passionate about his video games and playing it. He's got a very decent YouTube channel with a lot of content on there, and he reached out to Naughty Dog and was like, hey, what are you going to do about making this accessible for me? I, I loved Last of Us, but it was a lot harder than it needed to be. And they were like, you know what? Come in, let's talk. And they invited him there and he went around the headquarters and they listened. He sat there, he played a bit of the game and they implemented so much that he went and suggested things like having uh, all of the textures stripped away and just to have like yellow blobs for this is a can this is a bottle on the floor this is an item you can pick up and use that is a yellow blob bright green like for this is where a ladder is and your enemies being like bright red that type of thing yeah just having the colors and the textures stripped out very simple form and so you can i easily identify everything that you need to be able to play you know where the bad guy is and you know where that bullet is so you can go and pick it up and swoop it and they had a really good thing with the the crosshairs as well to try and make the the reticule like a lot more visible and noticeable and it really made a difference. I had the absolute privilege 
to go and help my friend who's visually impaired go and play it through. He'd never played Last of Us 2 before. Never. He hadn't played the first one. He doesn't tend to play games like that because they were just so inaccessible. But because the disabled community, uh, particularly disabled Twitter, just blew up with like, this is good. Try it. So he gave it a go. And with a bit of support from me in his ear going, oh, no, crouch down behind there. Don't move yet. Wait for that fella to walk by. (laughs) And he managed to complete the game. And he was so happy and it meant so much to him that it was kind of like a transformative experience in a way for him to finally to be able to go through and play a a game that is as complex and amazing and genre defining as Last of Us and Last of Us 2 to be able to go and do that um, it meant so much to him and he went and told all his other visually impaired friends and they got themselves a PlayStation and they went and bought the game and played the game like again barriers were broken down doors were opened and experiences grew uh, it was wonderful And I think I can hear right now some people probably in the comments and critics saying that, oh, well, they're not experiencing the art the way that the developer intended it to do. But if these sort of accommodations aren't made, these people can't experience the art at all. And I think you and I would both agree that there are many 8-bit stories with very unimpressive um, graphics that are just as compelling as these big, fancy, cinematic experiences that we get today. So I don't think that there's any harm in a developer or even aftermarket patching, um, peripherals, whatever, allowing a game to be played for someone who can't play it otherwise. Um, because then you're just opening up a market and what business doesn't like that at the end of the day, (laughs) like it's money in your pocket. So I don't think people would be upset about it. Now you had mentioned something like, so um, I have not played the last of us with any accessibility settings and I don't own a PS five, although I have seen the last of us two played in person. Um, How easy was it to find and change these settings to customize the game experience? really easy straight away uh, on the option screen start the game sort it tweak around we played around with it to see what worked for him sometimes he was okay in some environments to not need all the textures blocked out and to have color blocks on there and in some environments particularly the more darker ones when you're like sneaking around inside a building or something it was like "I i can't do this without it and just to be able to go there and flip a switch so that's the thing I mean they are video games are art and that means that the visual impaired community can access and be a part of this art where they never could before and yeah it's sad that they can't experience like the full textures and beauty I mean it was really a gorgeous game absolutely gorgeous but it doesn't affect anybody else's gameplay. Like you use it, you switch it on if you want it, you leave it off if you don't. So it's like they're still experiencing that art and it's brilliant. Yeah, I think I think that's totally valid. And, and now you're bringing up another point, which is, you know, it doesn't affect your gameplay. So I think critics that talk about how there shouldn't be an easy mode in games like Dark Souls and stuff, like that is just gatekeeping an experience from somebody who is differently abled. And that's just not fair. Or by doing that, you're saying that unless you have the same level of hand-eye coordination as me or the same vision as me or the same hearing as me, it's not, it's not for you. And I think that that's, we should, we should take that argument away and um, you know, standards like, what the last of us put into place and what some of this legislation is hoping to do as well will go a long way to to making that the same experience accessible for everyone and that's just having a good time with a game 
you know, like how hard you play a game on doesn't make your experience any more fun than mine or your skills any better than mine. Like at the end of the day, these are just pixels that we're manipulating. Like we're not, we're not Picasso. So um, <laughs> I know you had mentioned something about the difficulty of quick time events that I had never thought about. So can you share a little <laughs> bit about what that's like for you? Because I, I was shocked to be honest. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I love playing games like Heavy Rain, uh, Detroit Become Human. I, I love the expansive choices and story driven and character driven gameplay It's wonderful. But quick time events are a bane. Having to suddenly be in like a relaxed state on my hand and then having to button mash like <laughs> Bam, 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 bam. That is something that I am going to wipe my arms out if I have to suddenly do that. That's really difficult. Yeah. And I like a lot on things like heavy rain, where like I've got my controller and I'd be like, okay, press that one. Okay, press that one. Now I've got to press that one too. And then they want another one. And I'm like, <gasps> and I'm like, boop. So for I'm those of you that aren't watching on a visual me. media, Holly is using almost every finger that you can and her nose as well to play a quick time event, which is, is crazy. But I get it. Could you explain what it feels like to you when you expend too much motor control and don't realize it? Like, what is the long-term effect of playing a game with a lot of quick time for you? Well... It means that instead of me being able to sit there and enjoy it and play it and complete it, it can mean the difference between completing it and not. It can be the difference between this is the only thing I do today. Like If I go and have to do that and suddenly have to expel a lot where I've got to hold buttons, buttons down or I've got to bash buttons really quickly, it's... It has a knock-on effect and it kind of feels like my arms just turn to stone and I've got to try and somehow manipulate these heavy, like maybe, like if there were figures, you'd say that, oh, it's got like one point of articulation there, just, <laughs> like it's just kind of useless and you've got to try and manipulate that and push that and push through it. And sometimes you can't save during the quick time event. So I'm like, oh, well, I'm in trouble. So I'm just going to fail this and die then because, oh, yeah, there's right. Um, Log's just going to smack my character on the head because I couldn't bash the button enough to go and duck it all of a sudden. And it's that sudden, like, jump scare type thing of, oh, sudden there's a QTE, bam, get going with it. And it's so difficult and it will knock on for the rest of my day and sometimes the rest of my week. And the more that I push it and try and like push through, the more I'm not going to be able to use my arms tomorrow. Like it has that severe of an effect that it makes the difference between being able to survive and thrive. Wow. The difference of being able to like actually do my job tomorrow or right. not. Listen, that's pretty significant. And I think people who are in the get good community probably should look at having a little compassion for people who want to play the same games that they play, but perhaps don't want hours and days of pain for just trying to get to a checkpoint, you know, like that's, that's really not worth it. I don't think, I mean, I have a very recent experience that is a bit similar. So I can really emphasize like we re we recently went to play baseball and this is so pathetic. I've obviously held the baseball wrong and ended up with like a quite substantial bruise on my forearm, just from the end of the baseball tapping me on the inside of the, the, the end of the baseball bat tapping me on the inside of the wrist. I was holding it wrong. It was a very small, repetitive movement over about 50 or 60 pitches. But now I have this huge bruise and like my forearm hurts all day, all of the time. And I'm trying to type and write for work and it's resting on the desk and it feels like a pain in the ass. So I can sort of understand how, yeah, I super had a fun time playing baseball. It was great, but I'm never going to do it again. 
because it's it's not worth it. I'm not there's nobody there to show me how to hold it properly. And even if they did, I grew up playing baseball. I think maybe I'm just doing it wrong now as an adult, you know, like <laughs> this never happened to me before. And it's really not worth it for me to try. There's no way to make that accessible for me unless they're going to, I don't know, cover the end of the bat with a soft foam thing. <laughs> Which, which is something they do for kids, but they obviously don't have it in an adult batting cage. So, you know, I think um, just that very recent experience, like from the weekend, helps me understand a little bit about what you're saying, how, yeah, it was a super fun time, but the knock-on effects of, you know, something that hurts you <laughs> is probably not worth it. And if there was a way to make it possible for you to experience the same games without the pain then who is going to say that that's a bad idea you know i don't i don't think anybody has a leg to stand on when they say well it's it it just doesn't hold up to the integrity of the game oh, okay because getting hurt is part of it come on that's <laughs> yeah well, that's part of the problem with the get good community though that it is very oh well oh. Demon Souls is too hard. Get good. Oh, Cuphead's too hard. Get good. And all of the slinging about of labels of oh, Cuphead's ableist then because there isn't an easy mode. And and same with like Dark Souls, Demon Souls, as it goes on and on and on. And like recently with Returnal as well. Again, it's the whole arguments of oh, we'll just get good. There shouldn't be an easy mode. And I think that's another thing that a lot of games are getting a bit more wise to now, uh, swapping and being able to adapt the difficulty of your game. A mm. lot have got preset difficulties, but there are some like uh, Square Enix, they did um, Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. last year, and it was great fun. And you could tweak every little bit of that for your difficulty. It's fantastic. You want a, a slightly harder world to explore, but at the same time, you want your combat to be a bit easier. And you could just tweak it to exactly how it's suited for you and your gameplay. Because like, it's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to really be like a truly punishing experience. And I know like games like um, Dark Souls, Demon Souls like they are like part of it is that it's a punishing experience and part of it is that you're fighting like not just as the character but as you you're like you're all fighting to get through it but for a lot of people in the disabled community like living life is fighting so i don't really need to have to fight any more the necessary so come on give me a break you know? yeah and and to be to be honest the things that are hard for you may not be hard to someone else and vice versa you know i imagine that if we tried to live with some of the challenges that you overcome on a daily basis i mean i'd have more than bruises to show for it i could tell you right now you know because i just take ability for granted you know, if you had asked me a week ago if I'm going to have any bruises from playing baseball, I would have laughed at you, <laughs> like, you know, but sometimes, you know, people are surprised by their own limitations. And I think the get good community, if they were suddenly faced with a lesser abled condition, they would be, you know, quite surprised by the accommodations that aren't made for them. Um and, and I think that your idea about changing the difficulty instead of having preset difficulties, but instead of just having a list of accessibility options that people can toggle on and off in order to make things function at whatever speed they need it to function at in order to be able to play properly, maybe that would actually satisfy this crowd because it's not the developers putting in an easy mode. It's the developers accommodating different types of players and different types of play styles. And I... I don't think anyone is creating art that is meant to exclude. That seems like the opposite of what art does. <laughs> so it means meant to be appreciated, right? So, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, well, that that's quite interesting. And you had mentioned that um, word of what The Last of Us had done with Super Blind Man and for the um, accessibility and gaming community 
sort of spread. And you had mentioned a website that is very good at getting the word out and it's called, can I play that? Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about how that website works and why it's so popular? Well, can I play that is brilliant. It just has a lot of videos that will give you guides to different, um, say, motor impairment accessibility for different games. I recently watched one that was on a different site um, made by Special Effects. And Special Effects are a UK charity that go and help people with different disability barriers to gaming to overcome those barriers via different tech and different options and they go and put out fantastic games like I'm a sucker for Sackboy I loved Little Big Planet <laughs> and I really really wanted to play like Sackboy's Big Adventure and recently they've gone and put out a whole like mobility impairment motor issues video all about what you can change what accessibility stuff's in there that's been made and put on there uh, some of the things that for me personally are fantastic like being able to adapt what the inner and outer dead zone of your controller is so if i uh, like if i had tremors or something Changing the inner dead zone to make it larger would mean that if I just suddenly had a tremor whilst I was playing, Sackboy would just keep on going. Whereas for me personally, I want a smaller dead zone. So then that way it takes a lot less effort for me to push on the joystick for then Sackboy to move. Like sometimes, like some games, they make that dead zone so difficult and it's so heavy and it's a real battle just to control the character and to try and get them running so things like that are like brilliant being able to change how you interact with the environment of the game instead of like i mean i love these controllers because you, you can just like no up and down or side and side you know <laughs> started with the six axis and yeah. continued it through thank you playstation thank you sony for doing that and being able to some people that's really difficult yeah. so to change that to interact with the environment of the game to just go and be able to swap it to one you know like r3 or something perfect yeah and that's something that laura k buzz really highlighted that custom button mapping should just be defaults. Like, why do you care what button people push to do a thing? That really should have nothing to do with art. I couldn't possibly understand what story you're trying to tell through my finger positions. Do you know, like, come oh, on, yeah. that's just silly. And um, I know that Microsoft recently put out an adaptive controller. Now what you were holding up there for people that are experiencing this as a podcast without video uh, was the PlayStation 5 controller. Is that? No, it's just the PlayStation 4 controller. The PlayStation just... 4 controller, um, which has the multiple axes so you can, you know, move it up and down side to side and control it in, in that way. And um, the adaptive controller from Microsoft allows for play if you have you know missing fingers you know missing a hand you know it has real big wide pads that you can play um if if you have missing limbs or need to play with your feet or things like that um and and i think that sort of thing is quite cool because once again i don't think that it's part of the art exactly how i am controlling this um I would say maybe the only place that you could make that sort of assumption is with the motion control peripherals, but those have never really been required. Even in games like, um, I think Duck Hunt is probably the only game I can think of where you absolutely had to have the gun because I don't think it worked without it. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I, I think that it's good that we're moving away from it because anyone who couldn't hold a pistol shaped um, controller couldn't couldn't play that game and and we want to move away from that um and you had also mentioned uh with that website that it tells you things about how your mental health might be impacted by a game 
and we were discussing some solutions here. So could you frame that? Because in the mental health space, I'm not super aware of it. I think the only time that I've seen any sort of mental health warming was on Senua's sacrifice, um, where they use real people who had, I think, schizophrenia in order to frame that character's experience. And so there's a trigger warning at the top, because I imagine if you live with that or are on psychotic drugs for that, maybe you don't want to play that game. Um, so can you just share what your experience has been um, with people in, in this community and, and mental health and gaming? Well, there are some fantastic articles um, from disabled gamers and their like allies. Because a lot of the accessibility stuff does focus more on the physicality. How can you overcome that physicality? Oh, like I have an audio processing disorder, so I've got subtitles on everything. If there's a game without subtitles, I'm like, well, that's me in trouble, you know. Um, But what's so good about Can I Play That is that they also focused on the mental health side of it. There is a fantastic article that I had a little bit of a cry about when I read it about a um, a guy whose wife died and he had just been avoiding all of the games that she used to play, even though he loved them. And one of his friends just suggested to him, why don't you just give it a try? Go back and play from her save file. And so he did, and he, he's like, it's a beautiful article about grief gaming and how he kind of reassessed and felt a connection there again with his partner by playing through her avatar and playing through the games in the way that he thought like she would. And it, it helped him to process quite a lot of his grief and... I just think that's really beautiful and something that's really greatly overlooked. But as well with mental health is that sometimes games are very difficult, particularly if you are having a poor mental health like time of your life or period where everything's getting too stressful. And there is a wonderful article on Can I Play That that is an autobiographic article of someone saying how, oh, look, I had to learn to just let some of these games go, that it wasn't worth the stress and the like trauma that it brought, because there are things in games that can be very traumatic. Uh, like uh, my friend that I played through The Last of Us 2 with, he hated killing the dogs. Like, he's got a guide dog. He loves dogs so much. And he was like, oh, no, I can hear dogs. No, I don't want to have to kill a dog again. You know, like, and just being able to, like, maybe skip the dogs would have been something that made that experience easier for him. And so sometimes, like, as a, a gamer with, like, accessibility issues or mental health issues, You do need to go and take a step back and go, well, look, is this harming me more than it's helping me? And so maybe maybe I should just stop playing Death Stranding for a while because all of these unseen creepy monsters grabbing me and yanking my, you know, yanking my character around is is just too much. The we need to respect that and some games have gotten really amazing at it and unfortunately i can't remember the name of the game but in it part of it is that your mum the character's mum keeps phoning and giving you advice throughout the game and right at the top of the game it says do you want to switch this on or off to so it doesn't trigger or re-traumatize people that are grieving or who have lost their mum. So they don't have to go, I've got a phone call from my mum and then burst into tears. They can just, they can just skip that part. And it it helps. Like it really helps. I think the thing about disability is not the state of your body or the state of your mental health. It's the barrier that's placed in your way. 
Like yeah. there's different perspectives, like the medical model and the social model, and I could probably go on about the differences forever. But the point being, really, that it's all about barriers, and when developers of games realise that those barriers are there, and then they go and seek help from people who get stuck behind those barriers on a regular basis, for example, with Naughty Dog and uh, Super Blind Man, that those barriers can be removed. And it's a really important thing to be able to recognise that whatever it is, is a barrier, and to go and think, how can we knock this barrier out? How can we make this wall a door? So yeah, I think it's really important that barriers are broken down. So games, they are art and they can be accessed by everyone and enjoyed by everyone as much as possible. Uh, I think there are some amazing things out there now, like particularly like for the Titan 2 for peripherals, like um, you struggle with a controller and get this little doodad box and plug it in with stuff and as long as you've got like a laptop or a computer or something you can help run it from a keyboard um there's giant fantastic buttons so you can just bash these huge buttons if you needed to like hit it with your your feet whatever works I, I like to think of like the example of broly legs and broly legs is like this um what is it like high leveled street fighter player and in the big competitive leagues and everything and he plays with his mouth he he just goes and kind of like stuffs the pad in his mouth and he is quarter circling he's pulling those moves off like i think better than i could <laughs> better than me for and- sure <laughs> yeah i mean and it's it's brilliant and he just took what was given is like well how can I change this what can I do he helps teach other people no matter what their ability and it's just so good I just think sometimes there is a problem with attitudes because games uh, they're not made in a bubble the attitudes and perspectives of the creators and the people who work on it end up becoming part of the game and a lot of the time ableist attitudes whether they're meant um completely by accident or purposefully excluding people they can still be problematic uh, like i when i first found out about broly legs i just read an article and someone had titled it broly the broken and it's like, how is Broly Legs broken exactly? Come on. Like, it's, it's just attitudes like that that can be very counterproductive. And games, as much as they are fantastic, making like accessibility features in there and having disabled people come along and test them and listening to disabled people to go and overcome these barriers at the same time a lot of time you're expected to work for free Mm. and that is a huge problem for disabled people worldwide that our labor doesn't seem to be considered worthy of payment that oh well you should be doing this for free over and over they want charity from us rather than it's like hey pay us a wage and there are a lot of like accessibility testers in various different realms that do get paid and that is wonderful, but they're all ow. Oh, there are also a lot that don't. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, quite recently, I saw an article in the UK where they were arguing that disabled people should be allowed to be paid less than minimum wage, and I was like, "What? Mm-hmm. Like, just exploit them is what you mean? Yeah. Just exploit them? Like, tell them that they're not worth what every other human gets? No. Nah. Um, well, I think. We're going to wrap it up there. I'll give some final thoughts and then I'll come to you for any of of your final points. I think 
from me, widening what it means to make games accessible is really important and taking in not just physical, but mental factors as well. Like some things that we haven't touched on, but are huge is people with gambling addictions or depression or bipolar disorder or an inability to control their addiction to video games and things like that. Like those people need to be looked after and um, helped in order to enjoy games in a safe and productive way. And um, I think that's probably where the future of accessibility is going to lie, is looking beyond the physical into, you know, the, the realm of the mental space as well. And I know that some companies are doing that. I mean, Grand Theft Auto comes to mind with a trigger warning before a torture scene they had in a, um, an old game, uh, an old Grand Theft Auto game. I think it's still GTA V. That game's been out for so long at this point. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I... I found it helpful, although I think it would have been more helpful personally to be able to skip it. Torture isn't something that I enjoy in my gaming. Um, and I think that sort of choice doesn't really detract from the art, because if you think about all other pieces of art, you can choose what you want to consume and, you know, you have that option. So perhaps it's time to bring those sort of options to games, because unfortunately, games are a sort of media that are a bit of surprise. Like when you get to it, you're a bit shocked by what you might find. So, you know, how do we look after the vulnerable um, and differently abled people in our communities, I think, is probably where the whole conversation should go next. What about you? What are your final thoughts? Um. I think that the gaming industry has come a really long way for accessibility and I think there's a long way it can go still but I am loving what is there at the moment and it is bringing so much joy and so much warmth and experience and like, for example like I really love playing Death Stranding I love the huge open wide environments like I have mobility issues so I can't do what I used to my mum always goes and tells this story about how I ran all the way up Glastonbury tour and uh, I ran all the way along um oh, what is it Hadrian's wall <laughs> and so but that was when I was like really really young yeah uh, I can't do that stuff anymore uh, I so couldn't do that time... now I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> I'd be yeah, gassed <laughs> <laughs> to be able to go and play Death Stranding and interact with these glorious, beautiful, huge outdoor environments and to in some way still be kind of hill walking, it's, it's lovely. And I know that there are so many people during lockdown that played games like Death Stranding or Red Dead 2. And they found those huge open environments, absolute joy to go there, to explore, to feel like you're a part of it and you're not just cooped up in the same four walls. And I think that was very powerful. Yeah. No, I, I think that's super powerful. And I think as VR becomes more accessible as well, those experiences, I think, will become more commonplace. Like, I look forward to sort of where that goes and, and experiencing those environments in different ways other than just on my screen. Um, okay, cool. Excellent final thoughts. And I, I really do want to thank you for the discussion today. That does wrap up this episode of Retro Rebel Gamecast. And Holly, thank you so much for offering your insight and your story and, you know, letting me <coughs> bounce off of you and, and hope to understand this issue better. All the notes from this episode will be posted on our site, templateofgeek.com. If you want to add to the discussion or reach out with questions, sound off in the comments or email us via retrorebel at templeofgeek.com. If you like what you hear, head over to wherever you download your podcasts and subscribe so you'll be sure to get each episode as it's released and rate us because that really helps our show. But until the next time, we'll see you later. Bye.